things. So, um, yeah, thank you, Willie. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to invite uh, Amit Segev to have him with us this morning. Uh, Amit's a good friend. We go way back many years. Um, and he's the director and of the Division of Cardiology um, in Israel at Chan Shiba Medical Center. Um, and Amit's an expert both in coronary intervention as well as transcatheter valves, and transcatheter aortic mitral intervention. So, Amit, you chose a really interesting topic to talk about, uh, which I was surprised initially. So maybe you'll also give us some background why you interested in the topic of, you know, are we doing too many fetal cases? But anyway, welcome. Thank you for joining us in Monty High. Good. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Azim. It's, it's an honor for me to present in your rounds. Uh, and as you said, I miss you. I miss all my friends. Um, we used to see each other at least twice a year in, in the advisory board, but unfortunately, we have to wait, uh, I would say, at least six months. So um, I chose this uh, topic, and I call it uh, futility in Tavi, because I think that after about 13 years that we are doing TAVI, we started in Israel in 2008. We did the first case and we were very excited to do every case, even 90, 90 plus year old, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of risk. We took, it, we took this patient to the cat lab. I think after more than a decade, we uh, arrived at a stage that we need to sometimes act as the surgeons did before the TAVI area, when they said, this patient is not a surgical candidate. So I think we have a task now to say TAVI is futile in this specific uh, patient. And uh, we need tools to stratify or to re-stratify uh, patients, uh, TAVI candidates, based on several things. It's hard. We know for many years we used STS, we used, we used the OVO score. But these are all a uh, surgical risk course and um, we need to have our own. So, so this is why I chose it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for us, interventional cardiologists, to say no to a patient. And, and as, as, as I'm gonna show you, sometimes it's a very difficult and very active decision. So, so this, is, this is the reason I, I chose this topic. These are my conflict of interest. Um, uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of this stage and I, I'm anxious to tell you about my, uh, I, have, I have my own theory about TAVI and surgical AVR uh, and why, why did we need so many randomized control studies? So I, and I need to share this idea with you. So I take advantage and, and start with off topic a little bit and tell you about that. Then we're gonna define high risk patients and uh, try to identify predictors of cardiac and non-cardiac uh, uh, predictors actually that uh, result in poor outcome in patient undergoing TAVI. And at, at the end, I, I have to share with you a case that we did yesterday. I call it hemodynamic pair because this is something unique that, uh, that I decided to share with you. So at the end, there will be some kind of, uh, of uh, candy. <laughs> So, sorry, the other, the other. So, I think regarding this theory of disciplines of mine, I think that TAVI is one of, if, if not the most, evidence-based procedure. I think, and I counted, I think it's even more than 10 studies, 10, 10 randomized control studies that all published in New England Journal of Medicine, at least two studies in the Lancet. So, and, and I asked myself, why did we need so many randomized control study just to prove that a minimal invasive procedure is better than a major invasive procedure. And, and this is my theory of disciplines. And, and if the basic assumption in medicine is that medicine is going towards minimally invasive procedure. You don't need to prove it. This is obvious. This is the natural history, the evolution of, men, of medicine for many, many decades. So, if we take example from other diseases, let's go for to general surgery. So we know that surgeons did open whole cystectomy and, and more than a decade ago, they, they naturally moved to, to laparoscopic whole cystectomy. This, this, is, this is a fact. What about in other disciplines, like such as urology? You know, the urologists, they moved from radical prostatectomy to this very elegant procedure 
using the Da Vinci robot, minimal invasive with all this uh, equipment as you can see here. This is urology. What about ophthalmology? Ophthalmology, they, they did cataract, they cut all the lens and they, they put uh, an artificial lens and now they do, they do it with a two millimeter incision and the patient can go home after 20 minutes uh, 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 with, with, a, with good sight. Uh, what about AAA repair? This is the open uh, surgical repair of a, of a AAA. And now you, you all know that you can do it endovascular with this EVA procedure, very elegant from the groin uh, without surgery at all. And I'm asking myself, this is, and these all examples that I gave to you, these are natural, uh, uh, this is natural, this is the evolution of medicine. And, uh, and I'm telling, and now I, I'm gonna tell you why. Because this guy here is our chief of surgery, Chiba. The issue is he's a general surgeon. He does both open and both open cholecystectomy and lap cholecystectomy. This is, this is very natural for him to move from here to here. What about other disciplines? This is our chief of vascular surgery. He moved very naturally from open surgery, very brutal, a huge surgery to this elegant EVA. This is my wife. My wife is an ophthalmologist. She moved elegantly from this aggressive cataract uh, extraction to this elegant two millimeter incision extraction. And, and, and it is in the same discipline. The same ophthalmologist do, does this and the same ophthalmologist does this as for, the, as for the urologist, the surgeon and the vascular surgeon. What happened with, with heart diseases is this guy's over here, you know this guy, he's a famous surgeon. This is, this is Ranani, who is the chief of surgery in my hospital. And this is us. The problem is that if we want to go from an invasive procedure like surgical AVR or others to, to a minimal invasive, you need to cross disciplines. You need, it's, it, it's not just to cross disciplines. These are different societies, a very strong society on the left side, very strong society on the right side, and you have to move between disciplines. And this is the only reason that we needed 10 randomized control studies just to prove that a minimal invasive procedure resulting in a new aortic valve is better than a, an aggressive surgical open heart a, 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 a surgery. So this is just as an introduction <laughs> to share with you my thoughts about that. Uh, I'm, I'm actually in the midst of writing an editorial about that uh, uh, to explain why did we need so many studies. So let's go, let's go back to my uh, 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 presentation. And I think if we go, go back to 2008, when we started to do TAVI, we had to define also for the regulatory authorities, we, we need to define high risk patients. And we defined it as uh, usually as octogenarians with multiple comorbidities mainly COPD, diabetes, PVD, reduced ejection fraction, patient with renal failure, and of course, redo surgery. And we used relatively old scores, such as Euroscore 1, the definition back then was more than 20%, or the Euroscore 2, uh, the definitions was more than 10%. And, and again, the STS, all these scores are surgical scores, STS of more than 10%. This is the definition of high risk. A, a surgery. We also defined inoperable aortic stenosis patients, which are radiation to the chest wall, a severe chest wall deformities, a end stage lung disease, cirrhosis of the liver, especially with portal hypertension, porcelain aorta, neurocognitive decline, a very important issue that even now we have sometimes difficulties to assess objectively is what we call frailty. And, and, and many, many more. And we know frailty is a crucial issue. You, you need to assess frailty and usually, usually the best tool is eyeballing. You, you can use scores and you can use the um, walking distance and, and et cetera, et cetera, but the best way to assess for frailty is still eyeballing. And you know that this lady over here, as compared to this lady, they can have the same comorbidities, the same STS, the same comorbidities, but you know by just by eyeballing that this lady over here will do much worse after TAVI with this lady over here. And this is a very crucial task for, our, for us for our, as, as operators, cardiologists. 
And we know also this uh, slide, this is probably the most shown slides ever, at least 30% of patients with severe AS in the era of surgi surgical AVR are left untreated. The surgeons, they, did, they said, this is a surgical turndown. We don't, want, we, we don't want to operate on this one. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, I think more than a decade after, is are all suitable for TAVI? And I'm not sure that the, the answer here is yes. So causes of poor outcome or futility, if you want, in TAVI patients, we have cardiac issues, which is severe LV dysfunction, very hard to assess the contractile reserve of this patient, very hard to assess. You know, I, I know we have the butamine echo and, and, and MRI and everything, but still, still very hard to assess. This group of patients with paradoxical low flow, low gradient, some of them are patients with amyloid, some of them are a patient with irreversible myocardial fibrosis that you can assess by MRI, but still you don't know the reversibility after replacement of the aortic valve. Of course, if you have concomitant valvular disease such as severe MR, especially organic MR, severe TR and severe pulmonary hypertension, and I'll speak about this uh, uh, next. What about non-cardiac uh, uh, causes, extreme frailty, malignancy, again, COPD and advanced kidney disease. And this is a very nice slide that was published about five years ago about how to, how to assess or risk stratify a, an elderly patient for TAVI. And you know, you have a patient with severe AS, you have his age and gender. Then you take into consideration all the comorbidities that you know, and you have many, many ways to assess his or her frailty. Then you have to assess the baseline functional health status. What is the baseline status? Do, are we going to improve the functional health status of this specific patient? Then you have to assess in advance, are there any procedural factors that might influence the outcome? And what about some post-procedural factors that will affect outcome? What is the risk for PVL? What is the risk for permanent pacemaker? And then you have the task to combine all these parameters and say whether we're gonna have a survival or quality of life uh, improvement after TAVI. And I think only by seeing this slide, this is a very, very uh, 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 hard task sometimes. If we go back to the original partner study of the inoperable cohort, this is the data uh, of the three group of patients according to their STS. And you can see, as compared to medical therapy, if you take patients with an STS of more than 50%, there is no benefit. This is after two years. There is no benefit for TAVI. So maybe these patients are futile, or maybe this, this is a fact, at least the partner, the partner inoperable patient court showed that the, there is no effect, beneficial effect of, of the procedure over medical therapy in these extremely sick patients. If we look at the five-year outcome of the same partner inoperable cohort, you can see as compared to medical therapy, even with TAVI, if you follow the patient for five years, the mortality rate even with TAVI is 72%. This is the mortality rate in elderly, very sick patients, inoperable by definition as compared to medical therapy. It's better than medical therapy, but still, this is the mortality rate after five years. And we know that the greatest benefit of, of the procedure is in patients with, with a low STS. We know it now for sure after the, after the partner three and all the low risk uh, uh, trials. And we know that there is no benefit in 21% of patients with an STS of more than 15% even after uh, uh, five years. So this comes to define futility, and this is just a regular definition that I took from the, uh, from the internet. F what is futile? Futile is incapable of producing any result, failing utterly of the desired end through intrinsic defect, useless or ineffectual or vain. And you need to identify here, th this group of patients that are, they, they are extremely high risk, and maybe here in the extreme red, this is also futile, the procedure is futile in this subset. Before we are trying to assess for futility, we need to define what are the goals for TAVI in, in a very high risk patient. First, we need to, ask, to think what, what is, we need of course to provide best medical care for each patient. We need to, uh, 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 to uh, 
improve life expectancy, to lend life, to improve quality of life. And we need to assess what are the personal goals, the hopes and aspiration of each individual patient. And of course, this needs to take into consideration other, so other issues such as social goals for healthcare and economic policy. And this is very different between countries, between societies. This is a very nice patient. Uh, uh, this is a very nice paper from uh, Quebec. Uh, with, with a very uh, uh, attractive title, to Tavi or not to Tavi. And they, this is, I, I truly recommend because it's a, to, to read it because this is a very good overview of identified patients that are unlikely to benefit from transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And they go over several issues. One of them is, of course, chronic lung disease. Chronic lung disease, you can see on the right side in red that in patients with O2 dependent COPD, the one-year mortality rate is more than almost, almost 30%. So this group, I, I'm not saying you, you, you should turn them down, but you have to consider that the mortality rate after one year, even with study, is 30%. What about chronic kidney disease? You take a patient, if in, in, and if after TAVI, you have both acute renal failure leading to dialysis, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of survival after TAVI. So after more than 18 months, you have 100% mortality rate if you cause AF resulting in dialysis as compared to the other groups as you can see here. What about frailty? So there are, as I told you, there are several scores that you can use. One of them is the CAT score. If you take frail patient with a CAT score of zero to two as compared to non-frail patient over there, you can see the Kaplan-Meier survival curve of these frail patients as compared to the other groups. What about other things? We, this is a paper that, you, that we published about four years ago, and we tried to uh, address the issue of frailty. And we said one marker of frailty is the base and albumin level. And this is not part, or not of the Euroscore, not of the STS score, not on, of every, any surgical uh, score. And we try to define whether we can assess frailty and assess outcome by the baseline albumin levels. And look, look what we found. We found if you take a cutoff, in this case, a cutoff of four gram per deciliters, you can actually define distinct two groups with total different prognosis. If you have a low baseline albumin, this is your survival curve. And if you have a high albumin, this is your survival curve. What about multivariate analysis, so if you put the albumin based on level in, the, in a multivariate analysis, you see that the hazard ratio for one year mortality is 2.3, almost the same as severe renal dysfunction and much more than other uh, uh, predictors that uh, were included in this uh, specific uh, analysis. What we did uh, after that, this is another paper that we published a year later uh, in, the American in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. This is the number one journal for, for the geriatrics. And what we try to see here or to do here is to add albumin to the traditional risk scores that we use to assess outcome after TAVI, meaning the STS and the Euro score. So we added the uh, uh, al baseline albumin level to the traditional risk scores. And look what we found. This is extremely important to my opinion. If you take Euroscore 2 and you, you put albumin inside the score, you actually identified only one group with poor prognosis, which is patients with high Euroscore, but only with low albumin. So the patient with high Euroscore with normal albumin, they do the same as patients with low Euroscore. So only this group of high Euroscore, yes, but low albumin, this is the, ish, this is the main group with, with worse outcome after TAVI. And this is the same for STS. If you add albumin into the traditional STS score, you find that the only group with poor prognosis after TAVI is the group with ISTS and low albumin level, as you can see here. And this is the multivariate analysis. If you take, again, the high Euroscore 2 and low albumin, the hazard ratio for one year mortality is 2.7 as compared to the other three groups that they, all these other three groups, they, they behave the same in terms of mortality. 
And the same goes for ISTS and low albumin. The hazard ratio here is 4.5 as compared to the other three groups. So just by adding a simple parameter that you have in your baseline chemistry, based on albumin can add a very important tool to your risk stratification of patients. And this is a very nice statistical analysis called NRI or net reclassification index. If you add albumin to, the, to STS, 42% of patients are reclassified correctly, meaning as high or low risk just by adding albumin. If you add albumin to your score two, 44% are reclassified correctly to the high or low uh, risk groups. Another issues from the Quebec paper to Tavi or not to Tavi is the issue of the flow or the transaortic flow and gradient. And you can see here, if you take all the groups, uh, uh, the group with low flow, low gradient, they have the worst prognosis after Tavi. And it doesn't matter actually if your, your EF is low or, or if your EF is normal. The, the prognosis of patients with low gradients is worse than patients with a high gradient uh, uh, after TAVI. What about pulmonary hypertension? Do we need to assess aggressively every patient for a, a, the a possibility of having pre-capillary and not just post-capillary pulmonary hypertension? Maybe yes, because if you have a combined pulmonary hypertension, meaning both pre-capillary and post-capillary, so there is a permanent a, 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 a pulmonary damage in these patients, the prognosis after TAVI is the worst. We also checked it in a, in a paper that we published five years ago, show, showing that if you have a, 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 in patients with a, a post TAVI, a persistent pulmonary hypertension, the mortality after two years was 30%. As, com as compared to patient with the resolution, with a decrease of the pulmonary pressure after the procedure. What about the coexistence of, a, of other valvular diseases just such as MR? This is a very nice meta-analysis show that if you have a combined severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation, the outcome of this group of patient is worse uh, uh, as compared to patient without mitral regurgitation. Another, another aspect of risk stratification, which I really like, is this paper that was published by Philippe Genero in European Journal in 2017. This is an analysis from the Partner 2 trials, and they actually defined what they called cardiac damage classification. This is really nice because just by echo, you can classify patients according to the degree of damage to the heart, meaning that stage zero is a normal heart beside, of course, aortic stenosis. Then stage one is when you have an LV damage, meaning the LV mass index is high, or you have signs of diastolic dysfunction, or you have a reduced ejection fraction. Then the stage two, when the damage goes back to the LA and the mitral valve, and when you have an enlarged left atrium, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation or atrial fibrillation. Stage three, is when the damage goes back to the pulmonary vasculature and you have tricuspid damage. So if the pulmonary pressure is more than 60, and if you have moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation, this is stage three. And stage four is where you have RV damage already. So moderate to severe right ventricular dysfunction. So this is very elegant classification. And this is what they found. They found that mortality according to the cardiac damage stage, look how you can define five distinct group with different prognosis, starting from stage zero up to stage three and four, with a, a, just a reminder, here you have patient with severe TR, and here you have patient with RV dysfunction. And this is a, a, true for all-cause death and for cardiac death. And also, if you analyze with 30-day landmark analysis, you have the same distribution of a prognosis after TAVI according to the stage. What we did uh, after reading this uh, paper by Philippe Genero, we took our registry. In Israel, we have a multi-center TAVI registry that we started several years ago, uh, combining cases from the main four big hospitals uh, in Israel, and you know the names, from Sheba, from Tel Aviv, Rabin, and Adassa. 
And already, we have already more than 6,000 patients. Uh, uh, the first implantation in Israel was in September, in, in September 2008. Uh, and we are very proud of this study registry that resulted in many, many publications already. So we took this study registry and we say, let's validate the cardiac damage classification, not on a, a randomized control study, let's validate it in a real life setting of all comers of patients undergoing TAVI. And we, what we did as well, we combined albumin to this cardiac damage classification. So we took cardiac damage classification plus one marker of frailty, and we try to see, can we predict outcome after TAVI? And again, very nice, uh, distinct groups of uh, five groups with different prognosis. Uh, stage four, you can see here, this is on our, our uh, registry. It was published this year in International Journal of Cardiology. And you can see from zero, from stage zero to stage four, uh, look at the mortality rate after in patients, uh, the one year mortality rate in patients uh, with RV dysfunction is, uh, is about uh, 30%. What we did here is that we added based on albumin level. We took, for example, only stage three and four. So if you took three, uh, uh, stage three and four, this is the red curve. This is the prognosis after TAVI in patients with TR or severe uh, or a significant RV dysfunction. But these two curves here, the green curve is when your albumin is high. So when your albumin is high, your prognosis is better. But if you have a combination of cardiac damage, stage three and four, and low albumin ever, so you're also frail, you're frail with RV dysfunction and severe TR, this is your prognosis. So your prognosis is much worse than the other uh, group with high uh, albumin level. And this is, the, uh, this is what we did in our validation. This is the multivariate uh, analysis showing the hazard ratio of 1.4 for every one point increment in, uh, in the staging uh, classification. Another study that we did, this is our friends from Rabin Medical Center. Uh, they actually were able to provide a tool that you can use uh, still needs to validate this, validate this tool in a different subset of patients. But here you can see that you can have, you can have many, many parameters of a frailty that you combine, a, not for frailty, for futility that you combine, that you can combine and you can actually have a, a, a risk at the end and you can assess the futility of every in the individual patient. So, in terms of inverse predictors, this, what we know for, what can we take from the big registries such as the France 2 registry, this is a paper from six years ago, what are the invest, inverse predictors? So one of them is age of more than 90, low BMI, New York Heart Association of four, a patient, as I said, with pulmonary hypertension, with critical hemodynamic state, with a, severely sick patient with two, more than two episodes of pulmonary edema per year, patient with respiratory insufficiency, patient on dialysis, and of course, patient with non-transfemoral access. This is another paper from the partners uh, study. These are the risk, uh, 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 the risk predictors from the partner. You can see patient with kidney disease, oxygen-dependent chronic lung disease, lower mini-mental status examination, uh, as, as I showed you, a uh, low uh, uh, mean trans aortic gradient, lower walking distance, and of course prohibitive risk is when there is a 50% chance of mortality or lack of quality of life improvement at six months. This is very nice to say, but very, nice, very, very hard uh, to assess and predict. And, and at the end, you have to, you have to remember that, that TAVI is still a, a very expensive procedure and if you compare it to medical therapy, still there is an access of, of $52,000 when you do TAVI, and uh, especially in a futile uh, 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 setting. So at the end, sometimes you have a patient who is a frail octogenarian or nanogenarian. He, he comes to your clinic and he, 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 he thinks he get a valve and be young again and maybe do the next marathon. Uh, in his city, but uh, it, it, in reality, what the patient gets, he gets a valve, he stays almost the same in terms of quality of life, 
but with less money in the health basket uh, in every individual uh, uh, country. So I'm, I think that not doing TAVI is a, is a very active decision. And sometimes it is the best choice for the patient. And of course, we need to value patient preferences and values. Uh, sometimes, I, as, I, as I say to the families and the patient, this is not a medical decision. This is a philosophical uh, a decision. Uh, of course, we need to be, uh, the patient need to be informed by the physician recommendation. And as I told you, I think not doing TAVI is sometimes the more difficult but right decision. And this is something that I think uh, after 10, 12, 13 years that we do the procedure, we are at the stage that we need to say, this is not for, this patient is not for the procedure. So in conclusion, I would say that a, a certain group of high risk patients may not benefit from TAVI, we know that. And I think one of the biggest tasks that heart teams have is that they should identify core C patients based on many, many cardiac and non-cardiac variables. And I think I, I outlined uh, several uh, of these predictors that you have to combine in your head and maybe it, in each individual, individual patient, you, you need to apply it and say, this is a no uh, for the procedure. So this is what I had to tell you about, uh, about futility, and I, I would be very, very happy to discuss it with you. But just at the end, if I can have maybe, maybe less than a few minutes, just to show, as I call it, a, a hemodynamic pearl, because I, 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 I understand that there are many fellows in the audience. So I just want to show you a case that we did yesterday. This is a patient of mine, 80, 88 year old, very active, very a, a cognitive, in a very good shape. He's in New York Heart Association functional class three, and he has a low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. These are the echo parameters. The EF is 25%, global hypokinesis. The LV size is 65 over 57. Still, in echo, the aortic gradient was, mean gradient was 29, and the aortic valve area was calculated as 0.83. He had mild to moderate MR, and a pulmonary pressure of 40. And then he comes to the cat lab. He's a clear cut for, for by CTA, he's, he's, he's a good candidate for a transfemoral approach, a relatively large annulus. So uh, the plan was to implant a 34 millimeter evolute valve. And, and we, we start before implanting the valve, every case with hemodynamics. And this is the hemodynamic that we get. We, we get, and I say to my, my, my colleague, my partner, I say, this is very good results after TAVI. Not bad, and, but this is just the beginning. So you, you can see that there are almost no gradient. You can look at the slope of the aortic, uh, uh, the aortic pressure, but what I wrote here, look at the, the scale here is 200. So the systolic blood pressure is 177 or 180. So then you have to remember Rick Nishimura, with the, with the maneuvers that he do in order to better assess aortic stenosis. And remember what he always says, never assess the severity of aortic stenosis when the patient is hypertensive. So what we did, a simple maneuver, we call it Nishimura maneuver. I gave the patient IV nitro, it's a very small dose. Look what happened after 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, blood pressure dropped to 113, the patient was okay, but look what happened. Look what happened to the hemodynamics. The mean pressure here is 30. So very similar to what we saw in the echo. So this is not look like maybe mild to moderate aortic stenosis, but this is severe, true severe aortic stenosis after a very simple maneuver of lowering the blood pressure. And of course the patient underwent a successful TAVI with Evolo 34, and this is the echo update from the echo that was done this morning. This is, this is amazing for me because, you know, after surgery, with many, many years of surgical AVR, you don't see improvement after surgical AVR in the morning after the procedure or, or surgery. This is the EF. The EF went up just overnight from 25% to 33%. The LV size went down already from 65 to 59. This is the, uh, the gradient that we had this morning, the mean gradient was six, 
and also the pulmonary pressure went down from 40 to 32 with no PVL. So just a case that was uh, very interesting for me uh, that I wanted uh, to share with you. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for the invitation and the option, the opportunity. I mean, thank you so much. That was that was great, and I mean, it highlights really to me one of the biggest challenges I have in Zaven, right? I mean, you know, I much rather prefer the patient who has high risk coronary access or you know, a very horizontal aorta, very calcified anatomy with a high gradient where I know what to do, right? And it's easy to say, you know, the patient is, you know, 80 years old, uh, he's got a benefit from, from Tavi. The, the challenge is these kind of patients, the patients where you're wondering whether, you know, actually doing the procedure is going to benefit the patient or not. Um, and we see this every week, you know, this, over this last week, I was referred a 99-year-old for Tavi, um, who, you know, the family really wants something done, who I'm going to see in my clinic, but we see a lot of those patients in the United States where you ask yourself about um, whether the procedure is actually going to benefit the patient. And I think you're right. The hardest thing is to sometimes, uh, and the right thing is to sometimes say no, right? That the procedure may not benefit um, benefit the patient. Um, the one I'm going to let Sharon take out some of the questions from the Q&A and from the other participants. But the one that I struggle the most with still are the patients with low flow, low grade in AS. Um, you know, today, actually, one of our Tava cases today is a patient like that. The patient had low flow, known with low flow, low grade in AS. Gradients were in the 20s. Ejection fraction was normal a year and a half ago. And the valve area was 0 0.7. Okay. Patient comes back after a year and a half, and now the ejection fraction is 20%. Uh, it's still the gradient's low, right? Uh, very, it becomes now very high risk, high risk Tavi. And I'm often concerned in these patients, we don't really know how to predict whether the patient's going to benefit or not. Right? Um, we can't do an MRI in this patient to look for fibrosis, but it, there's not much data. And I think one of the things I use a lot is, is Philippe General's classification, but I kind of make it for myself pretty simple, right? in the sense that I look at the right ventricle. If the right ventricle is not super dilated and it's not dysfunctional, then to me, that patient could, ten, could, could potentially benefit. Um, I know what you say about severe TR, but I also wonder the severe TR group, if the RV is still okay, now that we have therapies with severe TR, maybe that's a patient we do the aortic valve and then we bring them back for the severe TR. But I just wanted, you know, what, what advice do you have for these low flow, low grade AS? How do, what, what's the work that you do in your lab to say this patient will not benefit? So, as, as I said, I think we don't have good tools to assess these patients. Unfortunately, I, I don't really believe in, in echodebutamine in this subset of patients. So, because I saw different different, uh, you know, reports after the butamine and the results after TAVI are really mixed. So MRI is one tool. If you have, if you see by MRI extensive, severe, severe fibrosis or a patient with severe amyloidosis, uh, maybe you should put a question mark about the, 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 the futility of TAVI. Um, I totally agree with you about the RV. RV and as Philippe Genero and we showed, stage four of the cardiac damage classification, this is a bad prognosis. And, but on the other hand, you know, some patients with low flow, low gradient, and, and it can be with reduced or, or, or preserved LV function, they do much, they do really better after TAVI. So the, the key is actually to identify this group of patients. And one of them beside the RV is still the degree of the mean, uh, mean gradient. So if you have a patient with, with an ejection fraction of 25% and he still can generate a mean gradient of 30, I think this is a very strong predictor of good recovery of his LV. And this is the case I just showed you. I showed you. Look what happened. The, the morning after, he recovered his LV from 25 to 33%. So there was a reversibility that we couldn't predict beforehand. 
I agree. You know, I think we 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 sometimes uh, undervalue the importance of doing the hemodynamics, right? I mean, the patient I told you about that I'm going to treat today. You know what convinced me about this patient was also the invasive hemodynamics. When we crossed the valve and did and did gradients, the pressure. I mean, the gradient was still like we saw an echo, 20, 25. But we gave a little bit of dobutamine okay, in the cath lab to see what happened to the gradient in the cath lab. And suddenly the gradient went to 40, which to me says that the ventricle is still able to generate a decent gradient. And so there's some chance or potential for recovery. You know, I shouldn't write the patient off, but we'll see. I'll, I'll send you an email in a few days to see if the result is as dramatic as in your patient. It's also a 34 millimeter avalanche, so <laughs> I'll let you know. I'm going to hand it over to Sharon. Sharon, go ahead. Yeah, so, so thank you for the, for the great talk. Um, I think what, what, what you said in the end of, the, of, of your lecture is, is very important. I mean, it's a philosophical, uh, philosophical issue. Because in the end, we have this kind of dilemmas in all areas of medicine, uh, to treat or not to treat, and when to treat. Um, and when you as a, as a doctor face, need to, pay, to face the patient and his, and his family and, 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 tell, and tell them the, that the procedure is futile, you might uh, get yourself into into trouble because uh, you know today in the era of today um, therapies are, are available like like uh, information is available and um, families often uh, search other doctors to do the procedure I mean there are uh, I mean we all know we don't but uh, we all try to understand better uh, the pre-procedure uh, risk uh, and assign it to the patient, but in the end, when you face uh, when you face the patient like one on one, uh, it is it is quite different. I mean, um, I, I have a question. I'm I'm, I'm interested what what you, is your opinion about uh, balloon valvuloplasty in this in this very high risk patient? Very what 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 do you think? Uh, do you think it 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 still it it is still uh, relevant? I, I don't think that balloon valvuloplasty in the setting of futility, there are several settings that BAV is very useful. For example, as we, we discussed, the low flow, low gradient, you don't know the reversibility. Sometimes you have supposedly critical AS, you do a valvuloplasty and you see some recovery of the LV and this is a very good tool. Let's, let's go for TAVI. But in terms of the assessment of frailty, the other comorbidities, and uh, I, I don't think that BAV is a good tool to say whether, whether or not to do TAVI. I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. And as you are correct, this is, as, as Azim said and me, that this is sometimes the more difficult decision. It's, it's really easy to decide to do on a 70-year-old, 75-year-old, critical AS, very active. You, you know you're going to go, do good for him. The tool that I use when I, in front of the family and the patient, is to share the decision with them. It's the only way to do that. They have actually, what I do is I tell them, I tell them my opinion, I tell them, I give them the, the, um, the, um, the data. And in most of the cases, they come with the decision not to do it. You can, you can lead the family and the patient, if you like, to, 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 actually to share the decision with you. This is the only way to, and you know, sometimes it's, it's hard because you have a 90 year old uh, lady, old lady sitting in front of you and she doesn't want Tavi to begin with. It's only their, the family that they want her to do the procedure and she doesn't want us to touch her. So this is, this is easy. You, you, because you know, you have to treat her, not, not, uh, not the family, uh, but I, I'm telling you, I'm telling it again. This is a shared, difficult decision. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I mean, I'll just comment on that as uh, well about the BAV. I'm very reluctant to use BAV in these patients, um, even in the low flow, low gradient. I mean, if I think the patient's going to benefit, I I tend to do TAVI because of the fact that to really benefit someone, for example, with low flow, low gradient, with gradient sitting at 25 or 24 you really have to get them down to a gradient of five, right? Exactly. To a very low gradient. And with BAV, it's hard to do that sometimes. 
have to be very aggressive to take more risks. I mean, maybe one of the places in these patients where I'm wondering about futility, I found it useful, well, is the patient who has COPD and AS. And I don't know how much of the symptoms are coming from the COPD versus lungs versus the valve. In that patient, I might do a BAV and then bring the patient back in one month. And if the patient's feeling the same, then I'm done. You know, if they suddenly feel that there's a difference in their shortness of breath, I may then, I may then proceed on to, to do TAVI. But otherwise, I think you're right. And you know, if you think it's futile, it's futile for everything usually. Not, you know, a BAV to me nowadays, you know, a TAVI doesn't carry that much more risk than a BAV. It costs more money and it's more resources, but as far as risks for the procedure go, it's not that much more. I agree. Yeah. Um, there's a question from. <clears throat> so there's a question here uh, in the chat um, regarding the case you presented. So, uh, he's asking if, in, in cases of low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, uh, there's any utility to just treat the blood pressure and following the patient for by echo. I mean, the, in the case you just showed us with the, the hemodynamic valve. Yeah, I think, I think it's crucial to treat the blood pressure and it's crucial not to assess the severity when the blood pressure is high. And I think every echo lab, every echo lab, if, if the patient comes to the echo and, and they don't assess the blood pressure and they just give the results without saying in the report what was the blood pressure during the measurement, this is useless. Sure. Um, Theo, I saw you raised your hand. You had a question. Do you want to answer, ask your question live? Yeah, so my, uh, first of all, uh, it was very nice uh, talk and very interesting topic since, you know, TAVR is getting more and more popular and we expand the use in a very elderly population. My question is that, uh, do you think that we have a very good definition of uh, like a frailty? Because, you know, it's not only for TAVR patients, also even for PCI. I feel that, you know, we don't really, we haven't really identified very well, you know, pa the frail patient, you know, who do we consider frail? And I think that's also um, uh, impact our practice as well uh, when we, in the patient selection. Um, do you have any research ideas or any other data? I mean, your albumin score, for example, that so you saw that when you implemented the Euroscore, it was you know that it was associated with worse outcomes. Uh, do you think that the other parameters besides you know the albumin that can uh, help us to identify this population, that the frail patients? I I, I think it's it's a, it's a good question, and I think we don't have a good tool. You can decide whether you want to use uh, several scores that are available. You can read the, you know, the, the geriatric literature and there's the CAT score and other scores that combine issues such as walking distance and, you know, the strengths of uh, grip, gripping and, uh, and many, many others. So you can, I, I'm not aware of a, of a big study trying to apply it in the, in the aortic stenosis population. And uh, unfortunately, most of the frailty assessment that we do is eyeballing, uh, and uh, you know, if you're an experienced physician, maybe it's good for you. But uh, this is for sure not a good tool. And uh, I think that the literature is open, and this whole field is open for research. Absolutely, I see Alberto. I'm not sure if you're able to speak. Uh, you had a question too. You want to ask your question? Alberto can come and uh, visit me in Sheba. He's from Israel. Ah, you know Alberto? Yeah. Alberto, Alberto, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Here can we go, Alberto. Alberto. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? I would like to ask uh, Hamid, hi Hamid. Uh, hi. What about, what about elderly, uh, let's say uh, 80, 85 and more, with low gradient, low flow, and severe coronary artery stenosis. Severe coronary artery stenosis. Thank you. Severe coronary stenosis. I, I could, I can, I, can you, you have a patient? You have a patient with low gradient, low ejection fraction, 
and severe coronary disease. What is your so opinion? You mean a patient with moderate aortic stenosis, no but moderate, concomitant no severe moderate, CT? Severe aortic stenosis with low flow, low gradient, and severe coronary disease. What is your approach? So it depends on the, on the total risk of the patient. If this patient is a surgical candidate, you have to approach the coronary disease separately and the aortic stenosis separately. If he's, a, if, if he's a low risk patient and can go for surgery with severe coronary disease, so this is the best option for him, surgical AVR with bypass surgery. If this patient is high risk for surgery, so you need to treat both uh, uh, percutaneously. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Amit, thank you. Yeah, Alberto, I would add to that, you know, um, I mean, most of the, we get referred a lot of these patients from our surgeons, actually, who don't want to operate on them. So we we will stage it. We will do the coronary intervention oh, yeah. first. Um, and sometimes it's a very complex coronary intervention requiring atherectomy or it's left main. I might also do a BAV at the time of the coronary intervention. So, you know, a very gentle BAV with maybe an 18 millimeter balloon, just so that I don't have any complications or issues while I do the intervention. I'll do the intervention, revascularize, and then bring them back in a few weeks for the TAVA. Often you see that in your, as you wait those few weeks, the ejection fraction actually may come up as well, uh, which then makes the TAVA a little bit easier too. I hope I, I, I totally agree. Okay, thank you. I totally agree. I, I, I always, always recommend to stage coronary intervention from the TAVI procedures. This is, I think, crucial. You need to stage these procedures. Never be tempted to do this, to do them simultaneously, even if you have a type A lesion in the right coronary artery. Right. Excellent. Um, any more questions? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. Um, that was superb. Um, in, uh, like I say, I, we miss you, and I'm sorry we will not see you next week. Normally, we both next week will be in Tel Aviv. In yeah? Tel Aviv. But not this year. Hopefully next year. We come to Tel Aviv to visit next all our year. friends again. Uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And I'm going to trouble you to next year give us another talk, please, Amit. Thank you so much. <laughs>